Welcome back to the second part of the Government Cover-Ups Iceberg. The first video didn't do as well as I had hoped on YouTube. That's okay. The algorithm kind of buried it. I was kind of expecting it. But I am happy with how the video itself turned out. And to everybody who watched it, thank you so much for watching. I, it means the world. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all the new subscribers. I can't thank you enough for subscribing and watching these videos. And I hope this gets out to more people. Because it's from what I've seen, people really liked the video, which... It's just amazing, and uh, I hope that YouTube can share it with more people this time so more people can experience it. Thank you so much for watching. Let's get right into it. It started as a normal Saturday night on August 27th, 1987 in Bryant, Arkansas. Teenagers Don Henry, 16, and Kevin Ives, 17, popular students who were gearing up for their senior year at Bryant High School, had decided to hang out with a group of friends at a local commuter parking lot, a popular gathering place for teens. Kevin and Don were typical teenagers who enjoyed working on their cars, a firebird and a Camaro, hunting, and going out with their girlfriends. Around midnight, they left their friends to go to Don's house, where the boys planned on spending the night. Kevin waited outside on the porch while Don went inside to chat with his dad. It was around 12.15 a.m. on August 23rd when Don grabbed his 22 rifle in one of his dad's spotlights that he and Kevin departed for the woods and the railroad tracks that ran behind Don's home. They were going spotlighting, a form of night hunting in which a bright line is shown in the eyes of the animal transfixing it and allowing it to be easily shot. Around 4 a.m., a 6,000 ton cargo train a mile long was making its regular nightly run north from Texarkana to Little Rock at a speed of 52 miles per hour. Just passing the town of Bryant and approaching Alexander, engineer Stephen Schroyer noticed two immobile figures laying parallel across the tracks, covered from the waist down with a light green tarp and with their arms straight down by their sides. He immediately laid down the horn and placed the train to a frantic emergency stop. Less than five seconds later, with no reaction or movement by either of the boys on the tracks, the train made impact with the two bodies, carrying them for a half mile before the train came to a complete stop. This is the story of the death of Kevin Ives and Don Henry. It's a tragic one, one filled with corruption, police incompetence, or police corruption, and the sad tale of families trying to bring the murderers to justice. The autopsy was conducted by Dr. Fami Malak, who, we'll get back to him in a minute. He ruled it as death by marijuana intoxication. Y yeah, yeah, I know. He said they smoked 20 marijuana cigarettes, which, put them into a coma in which they decided to lay down on train tracks, cover them, their own bodies with a green tarp, and then they were so out of it in, in such a marijuana-induced coma that the train was rolling right next to them. They didn't notice, they didn't hear anything, didn't feel anything, were just hanging out there and then <clears throat> splattered. Apologies to the families for my description of that, but that's what happened. Also, furthermore, when the boys went splat the chunks and um splatter was not a bright red like you'd expect it was a dark very dark red almost a purple which showed that they had been dead for some time so we already know that Fami Malik's autopsy was bs and the hospital that they supposed they went to for the autopsy had no record of them ever being there uh kevin's body was stabbed don't know if the marijuana made him do it but it was ruled an accidental death, which is just infuriating on so many levels. But uh, witnesses started coming forward and started saying that they'd like to give testimony in a trial. Uh, so all of them died. All of them. Uh, in increasingly impossible ways. One of them was beheaded. Uh, Dr. Fami Malik was also to perform the autopsy and ruled that he had died of a heart attack. And then the dog in the, fam in the household had not been fed, and so he got so hungry that he gnawed off his head and consumed the entire thing, bones and all. The official report for this man's death. I don't even know what to say to that. Anyway, they found the head, the severed head, in a dumpster a couple days later. So, I mean, also BS. Anyway, people were run off the road, people were shot. Uh, basically, everything in every major crime movie ever that happened. So one by one, all the witnesses were killed and everyone who wanted to give testimony decided, hey, maybe that's not a great idea. The families are still fighting to try and get justice about the murder of Don and Kevin, but it's been a long and painful process. They hired a private investigator who was probably told to not look into it um, and was kind of forced to stop investigating by the local police department and the state government, which we'll get into that later. I, I know you're thinking, just like I was, okay, well, maybe they uh, 
maybe they, put, they got somebody for it. Someone someone went to jail, someone got in trouble. Uh, I hope that that guy, Fami Malak, like something happened to him or he got, I mean, at the very least, fired because that's truly some corruption at work there. Uh, no, no. Uh, the then governor, Bill Clinton, promoted him and told him what a good job he did on this case. And he got a 45% pay raise. Um, yeah. This story makes me want to say things that I can't say on the internet. Anyway, basically, from what people have been able to surmise, it seems like Don and Kevin just stumbled upon something that they were not supposed to see. And as a result, they were stabbed, killed, brought over the train tracks, and then hit by the train. There's a number of things that could have happened right there in the area was a cocaine smuggling route by the US government conducted by Barry Seals and a number of other people. We'll get into Barry Seals later on in the video. Throughout it all, there, there's some very strong ties to the Clintons, which, you know, explains good old Bill giving him a uh, promotion and a pay raise at the end of all of this, but I'll save that for later. Uh, this, I could do a whole like 30 minute video on this story and I, I actually probably will, honestly, because I have so much that I can put into this and so many odd things that happened as a result of this afterwards. More people died, more children died as a result of this, but I'll, I'll save that for a later video. Okay, so we already talked about Roswell and Harry 51 last time with the iceberg, but it's, it's on the iceberg again. Roswell's here, so I'm falling the iceberg. I got to talk about it. The Roswell incident refers to an event that occurred in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico, when an unidentified object crashed on a ranch. The U.S. military initially stated that it was a flying disc, but later claimed it was a weather balloon. The incident has since become a subject of speculation and conspiracy theories regarding the existence of extraterrestrial life. I did that as quickly as I could. The Teapot Dome scandal was a political scandal that took place in the United States during the 1920s. It involved the secret leasing of federal oil reserves, particularly the Teapot Dome in Wyoming, to private oil companies in exchange for bribes and kickbacks. This scandal exposed corruption within the government and led to significant reforms in the country's oil industry regulations. It was a collaboration between the federal government, private oil companies, President Warren G. Harding, and involved ordinary oil tycoons, a murder and a bag full of bribery cash delivered on the sly. In the end, the scandal would empower the Senate to conduct rigorous investigations into government corruption. It also marked the first time a U.S. cabinet official served jail time for a felony committed while in office. And before the Watergate scandal, the Teapot Dome scandal was regarded as the most sensational example of high-level corruption in the history of U.S. politics. The Pentagon Papers were a classified study conducted by the U.S. Department of Defense that basically documented how the U.S. government escalated the conflict that eventually led up to the Vietnam War and how they were able to make money off of it. Uh, these papers were leaked to the press in 1971, and they caused a significant public outcry, as they should, and played a role in shaping public opinion about the Vietnam War. There are always problems with iceberg charts. Most of the time, as we go down the iceberg, it's either things that are incredibly hard to research, or just horrific, or in some cases, incredibly vague, and you have no idea what they're talking about, which brings us to our next topic on the iceberg, Afghan landmines. There are a litany of stories that this could be talking about, but uh, I'm going off of an article here that's talking about death from landmines being on the rise because when the United States leaves a region, they don't go through and clean up all the landmines that were left beforehand, so a lot of local civilians wind up dying as a result of that. I don't know if that's what he was talking about. Could be a government cover-up because the U.S. government doesn't really talk about that, and that's about, that's about it. That's about all I can find on that. The Tuskegee syphilis study was a study conducted by the U.S. Public Health Service from 1932 to 1972. Basically, they took a bunch of black airmen and infected them with syphilis without them knowing, and then refused them treatment and slowly watched them die. And took notes, so, you know, it's for the benefit of science. I don't know if it's noticeable in the video here, but in recording here, I am getting more and more upset and just tired of reading all these terrible things that the US government and some other governments have done. It, it gets to you after a while. And uh, you know, you think that Tuskegee Airmen, what could be worse than that? What could what could the, the US government do to step it up that's just blatant evil? Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to Ruby Ridge. 
Ruby Ridge, yet another topic that I could make a 10 hour video on. It is a clear cut story of the government screwing over one of its own citizens. And that citizen in question was Randy Weaver and his family. Now, Randy Weaver was in a pickle with ATF because they had sent in an undercover agent uh, to tr basically try and get Randy Weaver to commit an illegal act, which the government is very fond of doing. We recently saw about the whole Gretchen Whitmer kidnapping plot in which the FBI had sent in a bunch of undercover agents. I think there were, it was a group of 11 people and I think seven out of the 11 were FBI agents. And they basically got a couple of Bubba's to try and kidnap the governor, Gretchen Whitmer. And eventually they were able to bake up some half-baked thing through texts and use that to prosecute them and then turn that into a media story. Regardless, the government has a long history of doing this. This is one of the most infamous examples, Ruby Ridge. The ATF sent in an undercover agent to try and get Randy Weaver to cut down his shotgun barrel to a length that was just close to the legal limit. Because if you don't know, you can only have your shotgun barrel be so long. And if it's just shorter than the legal limit, then that's a felony. Because the ATF is a silly organization that somehow has the power to make laws entirely by themselves. Doesn't sound like an overreach at all. Anyway, regardless, the ATF agent pestered Randy Weaver for a long, long time until Randy Weaver finally gave in and said, fine, just give me the shotgun barrel and get it on my site. I never want to see you again. So he took the shotgun barrel. The ATF agent said, oh, I already have it marked to the legal limit right here. Here you go. And he had a little mark about an inch shorter than the legal limit. So when Randy Weaver cut down the barrel, gave it to him and told him to get lost, they now had a case to make against Randy Weaver. So they wanted Randy Weaver to appear on federal firearms charges. And when Randy didn't show up for court because Obviously, he was getting screwed over by the government, shall we say. ETF agents launched a full-scale attack upon Randy Weaver's house. Randy Weaver's son, Samuel Weaver, and his dog were out about to go hunting when armed men suddenly charged out of the woods and shot Samuel Weaver's dog. Samuel Weaver, doing the reasonable thing, picks up his gun and shoots the ATF agent who shot his dog. As a result, the other ATF agents shoot Samuel Weaver, and that will be the first murder of the night. This resulted in the full-scale siege upon Randy Weaver's house, which resulted in Randy Weaver being shot by a sniper, his friend Kevin Harris being shot by a sniper, Kevin Harris was also in the house at the time, and Randy Weaver's wife, who was holding a baby in her arms, being shot and killed by a sniper over a shotgun barrel, being half an inch too short. <gasps> How is the ATF not a terrorist organization? The Weavers later sued the government and got a $3.1 million settlement because I don't know how they could lose that case. Randy Weaver died May 11th, 2022. After the event, the government and the media tried to say that this was justified because Randy Weaver was a self-proclaimed white separatist, which is blatantly false and wrong. He denied this for his entire life but the media wanted a story to try and spin this and justify this so it wasn't as much of a black mark on the atf's history which i am happy to say failed tremendously ruby ridge is one of the most well-known instances of government overreach and just absolute evil after this to try and remove the stain that ruby ridge put on the atf's history to try and improve their pr they tried to launch a siege on a little compound in waco I think we all know how that went. There's, there have been people who do more in-depth breakdowns on this. This is summarized, I'm gonna make it super short, but abolish the ATF. The Ford Pinto scandal refers to a controversy surrounding the Ford Pinto, a subcompact car produced by the Ford Motor Company in the 1970s. It was revealed that the design of the Pinto's fuel tank made it susceptible to rupture and fire and rear end collisions. Ford was accused of knowing about the safety issues, but decided not to make design changes due to, due to cost concerns. It turned out that Ford knew about all of these things, knew about the dangers when in crashes, but he and the company were successfully able to lobby the government for seven years to not implement any form of crash standards for these cars. Uh, until 1978, on August 10th, when 18-year-old Judy Ulrich, her 16-year-old sister Lynn, and their 18-year-old cousin Donna were driving in their 1973 Ford Pinto and were struck from the rear by a van near Elkhart, Indiana. The gas tank of the Pinto exploded on impact. In the fire that resulted, the three teenagers were burned to death. Ford was then charged with criminal homicide, but on March 13th, 1980, they found him not guilty. And in between 1971 and 1978, when all the lobbying was going on, 
about 50 lawsuits were brought against Ford in connection with rear end damages, and it's approximated that around 500 people died. That is a result of their successful lobbying. So, another win for the government collaborating with large conglomerates and corporations. The US government has a long history of infecting the US public with biological warfare, which it's always a nice thing to think about. Uh, in the 1950s in particular, the US Navy carried out Operation Sea Spray, which basically they sprayed the coast of San Francisco in California with two different types of bacteria, which were later found to be deadly for quite a few people, resulting in a couple of people, one of them being Edward Nevin, who died uh, three weeks after being infected with the bacteria Serratia marsens. I don't know how to say that. In 1951, tests were also carried out at the Norfolk Naval Supply Center in Virginia, um, a massive base that equips the U.S. Navy. Fungal spores were dispersed there to see how they would infect workers in packing crates. Uh, most of the workers there were black, and they wanted to test a theory that black people are more susceptible to fungal disease than white people. In 1997, it was also revealed that the U.S. just sprayed the American public with zinc cadmium sulfide, which is dispersed by plane and sprayed over a number of cities, including St. Louis in Missouri and Minneapolis, Minnesota, which created a white stream behind the plane that many people think is now standard procedure for planes and aircraft today. And those are the white streaks that you see up in the sky when a plane goes by. I am not confirming that. I'm just reading the information that I'm giving you. In 2012, sociology professor Lisa Martino Taylor said that you know, there was a spike in cancer rates that could be connected back to the spraying of the cadmium chemicals, which were radioactive. In 1994, scientists also carried out Operation Big Itch, which was designed to find out if fleas could be loaded into bombs. Turns out they could. And this happened just a few years after the Soviets accused the U.S. of dropping canisters full of insects infected with cholera and the plague in Korea and China during the Korean War. This is something the US military denies as a disinformation campaign. Another controversial test took place in 1996 on the New York subway when scientists filled light bulbs with Bacillus globigii bacteria and then smashed them open on the tracks. The bacteria travels for miles around the subway system, being breathed in by thousands of civilians and covering their clothes. That's the same bacteria that they sprayed in the 1950s on San Francisco, which caused a number of deaths. Fun times. Recently, the House of Representatives has also instructed the Pentagon to disclose whether it used ticks to infect the American public with Lyme disease between 1950 and 1975. They haven't gotten back to us yet, so we'll see. The Iran-Contra affair was a political scandal that occurred in the 1980s that involved the U.S. government secretly selling weapons to Iran despite an arms embargo and an attempt to secure the release of American hostages that were held in Lebanon. Uh, the proceeds from these sales were then covertly funneled to support anti-Sandinista rebels in Nicaragua known as the Contras in violation of U.S. law. It's involved a lot of layers with the U.S. intelligence community and also involved Barry Seals, who we will get to in just a second. The Lebanese magazine Ash Shara exposed the corruption after a leak on November 3rd, 1986. Apparently an unnamed former military officer told him that the leak had, may have been orchestrated by a covert team led by Arthur S. Morrow Jr., assistant to the chair of U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff due to fears that the scheme had grown out of control. Barry Seal, whose full name was Adler Berriman Seal, was an American pilot and drug smuggler. He became involved in smuggling operations during the 1970s and 1980s, primarily transporting illegal drugs, including cocaine, for a drug cartel known as the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. Seal later became an informant for the DEA and provided crucial information about drug trafficking organizations. However, his cooperation with the government was discovered, and the other drug cartels he was working with got upset and assassinated him. He was also played by Tom Cruise in a 2017 movie called American Made, which is a biographical crime film which basically retells Barry Seal's life story, and the film ends with him being assassinated by a drug cartel. It's actually a pretty good film, and I would recommend watching it. The Downing Street Memo, also known as Minutes of Meeting, refers to a classified document from 2002 that summarized a meeting between British government officials about the US government's plans to invade Iraq, and raised a lot of questions about the justification for the war, which turns out a lot of US intelligence agencies were manipulating the reports to support the decision to go to war with Iraq, which led to a lot of controversy and people really taking a hard look at what exactly caused the Iraq war. Next up we have the Bologna Massacre, which was such a weird and convoluted one to research, but after a couple hours of research, um, what I seem to have found that leads to this being a government cover-up, because again, how these iceberg charts are, you get a picture with a bunch of words on it, and you kinda gotta figure it out. So, 
This is the best I could come up with, but it seems like in 1980, the CIA planted members of the Italian Secret Service uh, through the P2 or Propaganda du Masonic Lodge. Yeah, it gets weird. Uh, to bomb Italian civilians to cause instability to Italian infrastructure. It's a weird one. It's a really weird one, but apparently that's what I was supposed to be looking up for the Bologna Massacre. Another one that gives me almost nothing to go off of is uh, British Military Bubonic Plague, which is incredibly vague, uh, but I did my best with what I could. It seems like when India was under British rule, there was some kind of overreach in, it was government where Britain was infecting the Indian population with plagues to try and quell uprisings, and there was some form of bubonic plague that was spread there. I can't confirm that. I don't really have anything to go off of with that one, but that's all I could find for British military bubonic plague. Lastly, we have a false flag attack, which is just a term that means anytime one group or organization dresses up as a rival group and organization to kind of fuel public opinion against that group. So a good example would be start of World War II, Hitler dressed up a German soldier in a Polish uniform and had him attack Germany and then use that as justification for the invasion of Poland. And that about wraps it up for the second tier of the government cover-up's iceberg. I've been recording for about five hours now and uh, I'm going to try to edit this down to some form of coherent video for y'all. Thank you so much for watching. It means the world. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave a like on the video, leave a comment down below. It helps with the algorithm, helps it get recommended to more people, which is, I'm really trying to get this out to as many people as possible because uh, people really liked my last one, had a great click-through rate, but it didn't get recommended to a ton of people. So I'm trying to fix that with these uploads and try and get them on a more regular schedule. So don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell, so you'll be notified when a new video drops. Thanks for watching, stay safe, stay strapped, and I will see you in the next one.